we need to get together and let our voices be heard. This is Buffalo What's Next. I'm Jay Moran. I'm Bridget Jaipal Valenza. I'm Dave Debo. And I'm Thomas O'Neill White. After May 14th, how can we afford not to talk about race? About education, about segregation, about humanity. Since the dawn of this nation, racial violence has existed. The way we have designed our society has a big hand in what occurred in that Topps market. In the suburban area everywhere, we must work and teach our children. We need to make sure that we put more funding in our programs that help prevent gun violence and more money into art. If we're going to have some real healing, we've got to have space to tell some uncomfortable truths. And good morning. This is Dave Debo. On the program today, we're going to be talking a little bit about job development and a lot about Selma, Alabama. 57 years ago yesterday, Bloody Sunday, over 600 people marching on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, beaten by uh, state troopers, pushed back, and really triggering so much national outrage that it, it was the impetus for the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Harvey Miles is with us. He's the training coordinator for Green Forest. They're a new nonprofit that is trying to develop maybe as many as 600 jobs on the east side. Before the program is done, we will definitely talk about that and uh, how transformational that could be and what kind of um, opportunities that presents. But, Harvey, thanks for being here. It's so a glad pleasure. You were, uh, I saw a post from you yesterday. Mm-hmm. I think it was on uh, um, uh, LinkedIn. Yes. Where you mentioned that your father and seven other relatives of yours were on that bridge 57 years ago yesterday. That's a, that's a story that made me say, hey, he's got to come in. We got to share this. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm very glad you're here. Um, how did you first learn of it? You told me that you kind of gained an appreciation after the fact in more recent years and that this was the kind of thing, like stories of warfare, I imagine. Right. Every family might have had a veteran who didn't talk so much about what they saw during the war. Mm-hmm. Same case here? Right. Yes. Um, different pieces. You hear fragmented pieces from different family members. And I don't think they appreciate it or looked at it as a big thing when it happened and after it happened. I think to them it was just another thing they had to go through to survive and to advance. Mm. And they purposely sought out this protest. You see, you told me before we uh, started broadcasting here, they were from a town about an hour away, give or take. Yes, uh, Marion, Alabama, which is in Peary County, is the same area that Claretta Scott King is from. And kids came down from Marion to march on this bridge, yes. eight of them, including your father. Yes. All organized through a church? Yep, through several churches. Okay. Talk to me a little bit about that organization. Um, I imagine if it was 600 people on a bridge right. that there was much more organization to it than, than would be apparent right at the beginning. But But part of me thinks that these marches and these demonstrations were also kind of spontaneous. Um, not the case in Selma. Mm-hmm. They they knew pretty much that they were headed for conflict, didn't they? Yes, most most of them was not spontaneous. They were planned, um, and this wasn't the only protest they that they were part of. Um, even after this protest, they were in another protest that Wednesday. The, oh wow! Yes, um, they protested at the high school, and that's when my dad was arrested, and a few other relatives were arrested for not having a a uh, permit valid permit to protest right okay which was one of the um one of the pretexts i think for for the beatings and the the pushback yes uh you don't have a valid permit to be on this bridge you all must disperse now and when they didn't that's when it accelerated how did you first find out about this If, if you said that most relatives were reluctant really to share tell me about your journey of discovery when did you first realize a, that your family members had a role in this, and B, that it was a lot more right. significant than they were necessarily portraying it to be. Right. Well, over the years, you hear fragmented stories, and they may talk amongst themselves about yeah. it, and you overhear it. And when I lived in Alabama, 
and you start hearing more about Bloody Sunday and some of the historic events that you don't commonly hear about, that's when I start gaining an appreciation for it. Uh, was there a eureka moment where someone said, oh, yeah, I was there, and you said, really? Um, or was it just kind of a bubbling undercurrent through through all the family stories? It's It was more of a bubbling um, undercurrent about it and seeking out and asking questions mm. and being more intentional on finding out about it because they, it was just, I don't want to say it was just another day, but it was just something that they went through, um, some of the atrocities that they went through um, due to racism and, and Jim Crow. And they didn't look at it as a heroic event or if that there's some hero or they took part of um, something that impacted people even to this day. Tell me what you know about what happened, especially with your relatives. Take me through the process. Um, tell me the story of, I don't know, their arrival on the bridge and, and everything as it unfolded. So um, from what I gathered, after church, they traveled. Um, so after church service, they traveled to Selma and they joined the event. And as my um, one of my relatives said, once they let the dogs out or mm. holy H-E-L yeah. started, um, they were beat on. Um, they were tear gassed. Um, and one thing you don't hear commonly um, told, they were trampled by horses. Really? Yes. Uh. Um, the men was instructed to, you know, as much as possible to use their body as a shield to protect the women. But most ran um, to the other side of the bridge. Mm. And they were instructed not to fight back. Well, sure. Right. Civil disobedience, nonviolence, yes. all of yes. that. What injuries did your family members, members suffer? They never talked about their injuries. You assume they were there, though? Yeah, they were there. They no, never, I mean the injuries. Uh, you yeah, assume I, they were injured yeah, in, definitely, in this. Definitely. They just never elaborated on what that right. was. Because it, that was just something that was expected. Wow. You know, they didn't say, well, you know, I have this scar and this is my badge, you know, in history. It was just something they... It was just part of life at the time. That is almost more telling mm -hmm. than the fact that they were there, right. that they looked at the beatings and the abuse as just part of life in 1965 right. in Alabama. And to see them wrestle with loving white people after then. Um, here it is all your life. You've been oppressed by those who are white, yet you have some white lineage in you and just d try and differentiate the ones that are hateful and the ones that n that are not hateful. Is that a struggle they spoke of? Yes. Tell me more. Well, it was a phrase um, often used when they refer to someone as, well, these are some good white people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. They were good white folk. <laughs> and, and not all of them obviously were. Right. Right. How... Did you first learn? Were there photos? Was it just a story at a family reunion? Um, I, tell me a little bit more about how this unspooled and trickled out. There was some type of memorial um, service in Perry County, and they, someone in my family put a photo of the, uh, the program of everyone in our family that was part of it, and, and people who were from that area that was part sure. of the um, march and it ended up on our Facebook page, mm. our family um, reunion Facebook page. And that's when you said, oh, my God, you were there. Right, right. And my dad told me um, he had dogs sick on him, and, mm -hmm. and he wouldn't go into a lot of detail. Um, and I remember one time he mentioned it tearfully. So I can imagine the trauma at 15 years old, you, you seeing prominent people in your community, people you look up to, um, older cousins that, that are people of physical stature getting beat, 
horses trampling on them, um, your loved ones, women being treated in an unhumane way. I, I, I can't, you know, really imagine internalizing that trauma at that time. And you can't lash back. You know, will I live? But I have to join this fight to live. Did it affect him? If he didn't talk about it, that might be a question that is also unanswerable. But um, did it change him? Did it uh, end up being a, a seminal moment in his life? Maybe not. You said earlier that they were not necessarily aware of, of Selma's role in history. But was it a turning point in their own lives? I think it helped shape who they were and who they are now. Um, I think it helped shape me. Um, my family, for the most part, they they are always been helpful people, um, community minded people, and loving and forgiving people, and, and accepting of you know people. I have so many pseudo family members um, who just cling on to our our family because we're for the most part yeah. a loving family. People who tell, I have uh, some relatives that are the same way, and the phrase we use is uh, they take in strays. Right. They're people who will just open their doors, and, and Thanksgiving you might have uh, five or six people that are not necessarily relatives, but they come on over. Yes. They're part of the group. Same sort of scenario here. But what's interesting is you say that Selma shaped your dad such that that was part of him. I'm not confused, but I see a dichotomy. Mm -hmm. He saw violence, and it made him a more open, caring person. Describe that journey. I, I don't quite get that. Well, I, I, I guess he would see the good in people. Um, they came, Perry County is a very poor um, county. Um, it's still the poorest county in Alabama. Mm. Um, I even visit there when I was younger at a young age and we stayed with relatives who did not have plumbing in the house. And what year was that? Late, early 80s. Wow. And just not being judgmental and, and just that deep uh, spiritual conviction of loving people and not want to be, you know, confrontational. Because they saw the ills of what happened at Selma. Right. The injustice. They lived the injustice. That that was their every day. Any, if you were outside of the white community, even when you're in your own community, you may get um, a drunk white person that may want to come around and start some problems or whatever. Yeah. Right. And just that advocate for themselves. And I can say that's the biggest thing is um, taking up for yourself, advocating for yourself, standing up for yourself is was a central theme um, in my family. Are any of those who are on the bridge still with us? Yes. I think about four or five of them are still with us. And your father was 15 at the time? 15 years old. Were, were uh, his, his family members with him also teenagers basically yes yes um there was a few older relatives um probably no older than 30 mm. years old but th these were relatives that they looked up to sure sure that makes sense and yet the activism i i guess it makes sense too activism comes from the young yeah it does even then that surprises mm -hmm. me because martin luther king jr obviously um was not an old man during the time, right. but I don't think of him as as a young firebrand either. He right. was well, he was middle aged, I guess. Right. Um, but this sounded like, at least for your family, it was a youth movement. Yes, but the older uh, people were your wise counsel, and they were there to support. Um, another one of my relatives was told me when he got arrested in a protest. Three days later, in Perry County, mm -hmm. uh, my grandfather picked him up from jail th that Saturday. They put them in like a, he said it reminded him of like a refugee camp. Wow. 
with just a big tub of water with like a ladle that everyone had to share. No place to go Jeez. to the bathroom or anything like that. Hmm. Martin Luther King was, as we said, maybe middle-aged at the time. Right. I just looked it up on some notes here. John Lewis at the time was only 24. Yes. Um, that surprises me. He actually has, and I don't know if you knew this, he sort of has a Buffalo history as well. No. Uh, John Lewis, uh, this first came to light at the time of his death. Congressman Brian Higgins talked about it a little bit. The two of them had gone down to the Edmund Pettus Bridge on a couple of occasions. John Lewis spent some time growing up in Buffalo with a foster family oh. before he ended up back in Alabama leading all the yeah. civil rights protests that, again, included Selma. Right. Um, and he talked a little bit the same way you did about how Buffalo shaped him, made him be a little bit more of a uh, open-minded, caring, community-based mm. person. Yes. Um, and there are some other civil rights connections. Um, Claretta Scott King, the Scotts, and my grandfather, um, I believe it was Ovi Scott, her father, they were cousins. Oh, okay. Right. So you're related even to yes. all this. Was it organized through families? Or churches, you through the said. church, okay, right. through the church, which is almost probably the same thing right. in some communities, I imagine. Right, um, the church was the synergy in the black community where information in, in in information in the community things flowed out of. All these years later, what what's your reaction to all of this? Obviously, you're you're proud of these people. Yes. And just to see that it didn't end with, you know, the protest there, um, watching my family when they relocated to Buffalo, um, my oldest uncle, um, who's no longer with us, um, Cleveland Miles um, Sr., who has a street named after him in Lackawanna, New York, had a community store, and it was called the Color Store, and it's featured in Lackawanna Blues. Mm. And just this to see the affiliations he had in the community. Um, he was good friends with uh, Frank Merriweather, right, Junior. They, sure. they had a music group where with the late um, Pastor Gillison was part of it. Is the civil rights movement and the violence they saw what led them to Buffalo? No. Um, the manufacturing jobs led okay. to Buffalo. I, the reason I ask is that, that that gives us the segue. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about jobs and the east side. Harvey Miles Jr. is with us. He's a training coordinator for a group called Green Force. They're looking at uh, bringing maybe as many as 600 jobs to Buffalo's east side. But again, when I saw the post yesterday that said you had relatives on Selma, and that it happened uh, 57 years ago yesterday. I said we had to have you in and talk a little bit more about that. Okay. So we'll, we'll transition to a different discussion after the break. This is Buffalo What's Next on WBFO. This was truly the great bonanza of a lifetime. A poor man could head off to the Klondike and come back as a Klondike king. But the risk was huge. Watch the Klondike Gold Rush on YouTube now. The WNED PBS original production tells the legendary story of the Alaska Yukon Gold Rush. Over 100,000 people traveled to the far north intent on striking it rich. On July 15, 1897, the steamship Portland arrives in Seattle with astonishing cargo. Today's equivalent of $30 million in gold. It is the richest gold strike in North American mining history. Historians and authors bring insight and perspective to the event that changed the lives of thousands. And the gold, as one person said later, was as thick as cheese in a sandwich. It was the most incredible strike. Watch The Klondike Gold Rush now on the Buffalo Toronto Public Media YouTube channel. This is Buffalo What's Next, where we have conversations with the community about moving forward. To have your voice heard, press the Talk to Us button on the WBFO app, and we'll work to get your questions and comments on the air. Join us on Twitter at WBFO or email us at news at WBFO.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. And this is Dave Debo. We are continuing our talk with Harvey Miles. He's a training coordinator for a group called Green Force. 
But he's also someone, as we mentioned in the first segment of this program, who had relatives on the bridge 57 years ago beaten in Selma, Alabama, as part of a voting rights march with uh, John Lewis, Hosea Williams. I I lied. I said we were going to move on, but you told me something during the break that I think we need to touch on. Um, That even even the the situation with Rosa Parks and the bus boycott um, was really much more organized than I think people think of it as being. All right. Um, She was trained at the Highland Institute in North Carolina for nonviolence. Uh, w- along with Martin Luther King. So she just, it was more strategic that she was placed there and yeah. more than likely they knew that was going to happen. Almost like when um, attorneys will look for a test case to take something to the courts because they know that it will end up advancing the cause and making a precedent. Correct. Same kind of thing. Correct. At the bridge, um, you were all they were all schooled in nonviolence? They wasn't all, well, yes, they were school. Um, some, the churches, things were passed down. This person was trained, then this person was trained, and then it was taken to the churches, and they would meet, and they would mm-hmm. talk. And it Just like I mentioned, one of the things that they were taught to do was to cover the women. Yeah. To use their body as a shield to, cover, to protect the women. That was being schooled to how to do this thing strategically. If this happened, this is how to deal with it without being violent. Did your uh, relatives ever speak of knowing that they would be beaten? Was it was it part of the premise going in? They spoke of they were afraid of being killed. Mm. And yet they were still there. Right. Or when you got arrested, you had no idea what was going to happen to you. Okay. And yet, you you mentioned this earlier, too. Two days later, they were protesting again at a high school. Right. And being arrested again at a high school. Um, It did not get beaten out of them. The cause was that important. Yes. Wow. I mean, you get tired of, you get sick and tired of being sick and tired of being oppressed. Yeah. And then once you get that momentum, it was, let's keep the pressure on. Sure, sure. And in that regard, even though you said they were not necessarily aware of the historical significance of Selma, there was momentum, perhaps. Yes. Okay. Yes, there was momentum, and it was community. You know, they had to rely on each other Mm. to survive. Yeah, yeah, I can picture that now. That makes a lot of sense. Before we move on, is there anything else we need to touch on about Selma? Another thing about Selma and the whole civil rights is you can't take away the importance of the spirituality that kept everyone together and that um, brought whites and blacks as to be on the common cause and in the principles that Judeo Christian principles that drove the whole movement. Do you see parallels? Do you see need for struggle here today? Um, Obviously the, the genesis of this program was the tops massacre on 514. Um, And I know that that's different than constant Jim Crow, but obviously that's an issue that needs to be addressed. And we don't have marches on the bridge anymore. Um, Has has the concern, has the movement died? Uh, Did we reach a point where segregation was strong enough that uh, the shooter could come from Binghamton? Without protest, you know what I'm saying? Right. Um, Segregation back in the civil rights movement, I think, was protested. Right. Segregation in 2022 in Buffalo, not necessarily so. Therefore, the shooter was able to come here. I don't think marches are as effective because there's just to have a one of march and I have continue advocacy before and after uh, the marches to bring awareness but there's things that have to happen um, policies need to be changed um, people put in position to be more strategic and and to get the get real effective change done what needs to be done locally and I know this is a broader broader question than we initially had planned we, we will get to the job development stuff in just a bit um, 
But what sort of change do you think Buffalo needs right now? Buffalo needs to really focus. Buffalo can be a better city if they focus on the east side. Um, the east side is the weak, weakest link in Buffalo. If we can concentrate on that, I think it will improve Buffalo as a whole. Is the neglect primarily economic? No. It's systemic. It's not only economic. You see it in city services. You see it in, you know, the schools. You see um, the roads are not always Christine. Um, you see it in just services um, where we get crumbs. Hmm. How can that change? Is it intentionality and new policy? Yes, and it takes those who are at the table to make, you know, cognitive decisions that they will stop neglecting the east side. Those who have the loaf of bread need to make sure it's not just crumbs that fall from the table. Yes. All right. Are you hopeful? Do you think that would ever happen? Yes, I'm hopeful. Okay. Have you seen change? Uh, do you think there is progress? Yes. Um, I'm in circles where I see uh, progress that's happening and progress that will happen. And there's a lot of advocacy that's happening in a lot of pockets. What have, what have you noticed? And, and this might be the segue into the uh, economic development and the job development stuff you're involved in on the east side. But independent of that, where have you seen progress? I've seen progress where organizations are um, making more of a push to educate people to change and to bring services to them. And, and especially after 514, you're starting to see more money poured into this area. Which does bring us to Veridi Parente, a large um, startup company yes. that is making lithium-ion batteries in the old uh, GM Saginaw gear plant on, on East Elevon. Uh, for a while, it was the American Axle plant. Uh, but but it's the old GM plant right there uh, on Delavan Avenue. They've got a startup that could possibly create as many as 600 jobs. That's huge. Yes, it is. It is. What do they do? Tell me a little bit about the company, and then we'll, we'll take a break and get into uh, your job development efforts there. The company makes um, fail-safe batteries that goes in, inside um, for commercial use for um, energy storage. Power supplies. Power for... supplies for buildings, uh, power supplies for construction equipment, and also um, power supply for generators to um, be out in the field and they can recharge the construction equipment. So that way there's a buffer so they, they, they don't have to automatically gear up when the generator starts up. Yes. Or on the other end, when power fails, they kind of kick in, I imagine, to, well, to prolong it. The generators are just electric batteries. Yeah, okay. Right. So just like you see a generator on a trailer, it would be a um, a large, massive battery, battery instead of a generator. Exactly. And it holds enough power that it can take the place of a generator. Right. And then you connect a generator to it and charge it up, which is more efficient. Oh, sure. Right. Then continuously running a generator. Okay. And... The company, John Williams uh, of Ontario Contracting, a uh, real estate developer in the area, mm -hmm. involved in a lot of buildings, uh, demolition, and uh, redevelopment, has created this company and really, truly thinks that the, the demand for jobs could reach about 750 even in, yes. in his wildest of dreams. Yes. Take me through the process. He creates the company. He sees the need, realizes that he's on the east side and then turns to a team of nonprofit leaders in the community, uh, Bishop Michael Badger, uh, Jeffrey Conrad, who was working I know, with you over at Catholic Charities on Job Development. A lot of other people came together and said, if we are going to create this many jobs, then we need a certain level of job training and recruitment. That's where the Green Forest nonprofit enters. Yes. So my motto... Um in Green Forces, you can teach a person how to fish.
they catch the fish, yeah. now you are responsible to teach them what to do with the fish. How to gut the fish. How right. To, how to cook the fish. <laughs> fish. Yeah. Right. Because that person can take the fish to somebody else and not get all the fish back. So we want to teach people, now that you have a livable wage, um, now that we are um, investing in you as a person, now there's a series of life coaching that goes with that to main, to help maintain you and to help with retention. I don't want to be completely negative, but we talk a little bit about needs on the east side. Why is the need for that program? Are people not job ready? People are job ready, but their life is not job ready. There's daycare issues. Um, there's issues with transportation. And that's one brilliant thing with having manufacturing in the center of the city yeah. that we have all these bus lines that a person can get there. Um, we help with support with getting them transportation there. And we give them that wraparound services, and we help them out in ways that you would never think an employer would help you out with. And you said this, this was interesting. We, we spoke about this uh, before the program was on the air. There are no barriers. You don't need a drug test. You don't need a GED. You basically come to Green Force and uh, you say, hey, this right. person is ready. Right. If a person is ready and willing to show up and basically do what's required of them, they will thrive at Beridi. Is it job training or is it more, as you say, the, the wraparound services? It's all of it. Mm -hmm. um, we train people to do this work, um, which is no one has done this work before. So there's really not a lot of pre-training that you can get before you get there. And the soft skills training um, and just like things we do, just going through the handbook. Who mm -hmm. goes through the handbook with employees? Yeah. And giving people that wraparound service to to minimize distractions that keeps them out of the workplace. Especially, too, I imagine, in a manufacturing environment. Um, maybe in, in academia or in, in a social service organization, uh, the emphasis emphasis on the soft skills might be stronger than they are in a manufacturing yes. environment. Yes. Even in the, wherever you work at, you spend more time with your coworkers than you do yeah. with anybody else. So teaching people these soft skills, um, making sure they know the relative information about employee rules and, 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 and policies, um, helping them with uh, challenges and obstacles that they have outside of the workplace. All right. When we come back from the break, we'll talk more about this. We'll uh, look at some of the programs and obviously uh, we'll help you promote it. We'll tell people how to get involved with it. Um, Harvey Miles is here. He's with Green Force. They're a job development, uh, can we call them a firm? A nonprofit, right? Right. A job development not for profit based at the Veridi Parenti plant yes. on Delavan Avenue. More to come after this. It's Buffalo What's Next on WBFO. Listen to All Things Considered each weekday starting at 4 p.m. on WBFO. Thank you. Thank you. Ready? Fire! Some of the most iconic sites of the War of 1812 are right here in the Niagara region. Old Fort Niagara is a, a living history museum. Explore these historic sites in the WNED PBS original production, 1812 on the Niagara Frontier, now on YouTube. Check out the places dedicated to preserving and presenting this history of the War of 1812 to the public. We hope that they take away an appreciation for Sir Isaac Brock. He is known as a savior of Upper Canada. We want them to walk away knowing why. 1812 on the Niagara Frontier captures the passion each of these unique locations brings to the history of the War of 1812. Watch it now on the Buffalo Toronto Public Media YouTube channel. Looking for something great to watch on TV tonight? Visit WNED.org slash TV schedule to find out what's on WNED PBS. This is Buffalo What's Next where we have conversations with the community about moving forward. To have your voice heard, press the Talk to Us button on the WBFO app, and we'll work to get your questions and comments on the air. Join us on Twitter at WBFO or email us at news at WBFO.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. 
And this is Dave Debo. Harvey Miles is with us. He's with the job training group Green Force. They're affiliated with, connected with, really, a, a part of almost Veridi Parente, a battery manufacturer that's setting up shop on the east side in the old uh, GM plant on Delavan Avenue. How many employees do they have now? I think we are somewhere about 150. And when you started, you were number 47, something, you said? 40-something, 40, 40. So they've right. almost, they've at least doubled. In Since how September. Long? Since September. Yes. Is the demand uh, steady? Is uh, How long do you think you'll be in business recruiting people? When will the workforce reach a level where it would perhaps plateau? I'm thinking two to four years. Wow. Two to four years before. And we, I, because we we have a lot of demand for the product. The okay. product is basically selling itself. Really? Okay. Yes. And at that point, they're they're anticipating maybe as many as seven hundred and fifty, but probably about six hundred jobs. Yes, that's incredible. That's huge. What helped us also is the government incentives that just rolled out. So we have Bobcat, Case, um, Sunbelt want to use our product in their products. Okay. So we're not making products like the end product. You're, you're a component. Yes. You're you're an OEM manufacturer for yes. for parts for other people. Yes. Okay. I think of uh, I think of Bobcat. I think of like the forklifts uh, mm-hmm. in factories or warehouses. They are traditionally because you don't want carbon monoxide in your in your warehouse. They are traditionally run on propane. This would be all electric. Yeah. Well, they have all electric and they have. Electric drivetrain that that powers the, the vehicle and the hydraulics. Okay. Also, the most important part is that they're fail-safe batteries. They're not going to blow up like a Tesla. I was just thinking <laughs> of that when you said electric drivetrain. I was thinking of Tesla. Right. Um, but yeah, the batteries in some electric vehicles have had those sort of problems. Yes. How is this different? And I know I, I know you're not the tech guy. Um, but but how are these batteries different that they don't necessarily explode like some Teslas have? Well, what happens is um, there's anti-propagation technology in there. So when one cell fails, it usually is a chain reaction, and all that energy gets released, and it just it's a runaway chain reaction. The technology in there suppresses, um, we call it the secret sauce, these little pouches go in there, and they suppress at that um, cell. So there's no power cascade, as it were. Right, correct. What does the work end up being? Uh, what What do your new recruits do then? If If that's the product, are they soldering? Are they mixing chemicals? what What is the uh, What is the workload look like? Well, there's a there's a team, and then there's different operations on the assembly line. Um, there's the prep. You know, pre-assembly, and then there's, you know, one where the cells are stacked, and then you're putting a case around there and putting, like, the brains in there, the battery management, and it's encased in steel Hmm. as another um, safety. And then wiring all all the cells together because they're those little cells that look like, uh, you know, double-A batteries but a little larger, and some of them have – about 4,000 of them in there. Wow. So one of our largest batteries is like 1,500 pounds. Mm. How unique is it for a company to set up a not-for-profit like Greenforce to deal with its workforce development issues? In, in your career in the industry, have you seen this sort of thing before, or is it really a groundbreaking new sort of development? I haven't seen it Um but it makes sense. Um, usually companies, they look for non-for-profits who don't train the person specifically for, for that, that job, for, for that, that facility. Job. Okay. Right, yeah. right. And then we, for the first year, we are giving that, we're following that person and giving that person support uh, for the first year. So you have case managers who follow a new employee through the process. Yes. Is that you specifically? Is that what you do? Yes. Well, wow. one of the things I do. Okay. And we we have a case manager, but we all kind of will do as needed. All right. How does that actually play out within the job? 
Um, do you pull Joe or Jane aside and, and just chat with them about their work? Um, is there a shift on the line and then maybe a shift in the classroom? How is it structured? Well, they go through a two-week training. Part of the two-week training is they get all their uh, the orientation, you know, all the company policies. And like I said, we go through all the, the handbook with them um, about expectations. So we're setting the culture from training. Um, another thing we do during uh, orientation week is they take all their safety classes. They also do a financial aid, financial literacy, um, lunch and learn that we partner with Key Bank and Rodswell Park. So there's a lot of collaborators that we deal with um, to help with the wraparound services. So you don't want someone who's never had a decent wage before to just spend their money. Right. Off and, and, and create more troubles for themselves. Right. Yeah. So first of all, it's to make sure they have a place to park their money. All You'd right. be surprised how many people will settle for the pay cards. If that pay card get oh. hacked because they're from a third party provider, yeah, yeah, I can now they it. have no access to their money. And this is a and and these are usually people who are used to living check to check. Yeah. Do you think that this is a model that is transplantable? elsewhere or is it specific because of uh, the need if i'm in a economically disadvantaged area and i need to find oh gosh 600 people i'm going to create something like this is that the case or is it more universal i think it's universal employers should in your book do more of this kind of stuff yes um we have lunch and learns planned out that will bring resources community resources and other opportunities to our employees. Now they have money. Let's let's start planning. You know what? You make enough money to buy a house now. Mm. So you can work with Roswell. They have a uh, financial literacy department that works with the community now. And they will work with you with getting your financing, your budgeting, and your credit score up. And then now we partner with some other people, some realtors and stuff like that, that will help you at the home. Uh, right. And and we try and take care. We have partners like Belmont, um, Child Care Network to help people with different things. Um, there are some anecdotal things that um, may come up. We had one employee who is an immigrant. She could not get a car loan because of her immigration status. Uh, we found a bank, Good Neighbors Bank, who we partner with. They specialize in that population now she's not spending eight hundred dollars a month on Uber right. to get to work, which is transformational. I would imagine, and, and we always hear the phrase "generational wealth." This is a chance, perhaps, to build that. Yes, wow. yes, and 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 really bringing people in to explain like benefits, uh, what to do with this um, credit card you have for your your copays and stuff like that. The difference between your regular health care insurance and AFLEC that you have. Yeah. yeah. And building these relationships um, is key. And I, I I touch bases with everyone on the floor because I want them comfortable to, to come tell me their problems. And people ask me, what, what can you help me with? I'd be like, I don't know. Yeah. Well, what <laughs> do you need? need? <laughs> right. What do you need? <laughs> what are you protesting? What do you right. got? Uh, the same kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, before your work with Green Force, I know you were with, and we've, we've had you on the program before to talk a little bit about this, uh, you and some others you work with were with Catholic Charities. So you were at a perch where you were able to see the community needs in terms of job development. Yes. Independent of Green Force, what is the largest need in that arena? The largest need is accessibility to jobs. What do you see is some of your low Are you paying jobs? Transportation. Transportation. Sure. Not only with transportation, I did a favor for somebody and realized I should have told them no. They needed a ride to work out at Amazon Warehouse. Low pay, it's a burden to get out there. The one out in Lancaster. Yes. Yeah. In and the middle of nowhere in Lancaster. It's not exactly. It's not suburban Lancaster. It's out on uh, what Genesee and Pavement. Right. Um, it, you're right. Not not a place where I would picture a bus getting to. 
Right. So their turnover is high because it's almost impossible to keep getting out there. No one's going to commit to giving you a ride to go out there every day. And you're not making enough to, you know, buy a car or something like that. So why not uh, why not have employers take a more active role and work with the NFTA? Veridi is taking an active role and creating green force. Why not have Amazon knock on the NFTA's door and say, hey, we, we need more bus lines? But guess what happens? That time it takes to get way out there in Lancaster is time that you've taken from that person's life. Yeah. So it's quality of life issues. Because to get to Lancaster by 9, you'd probably have to leave downtown on a bus, on right. a slow bus, stopping every block. What seven thirty or so? Right. That yeah. That's a couple. That's an hour and a half right. or so each. Yeah. And, and imagine they're... if you have family. Now you have to. I have to leave before the kids go to school. Yeah. The time I'm getting back, and then the stress on the household because there's a lack of leisure time. Now it's rush, 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 rush. So, jobs within the community, just from your point of view, make more sense. Makes more sense. Okay. Location, location, location. I have heard, and I think it's Harmac on the east side, mm. that has done a lot of work uh, with the refugee population, yes. with the immigrant population. Um, something similar to what you have described here, where they teach them English. They teach them some of the soft skills. Uh, is that something? Is that the future? We're we are in talks. <laughs> Okay. So that's that's on our radar to do something similar. But I mean is, is this model something that other companies would embrace and would it allow them to instead of set, setting up shop in uh, Lancaster be down, be be on the east side. I think it's something other companies could do, but if you if you bring in people in who are not from the non-for-profit um you know uh industry, I don't think it'll work. You are not an adjunct per se of Veridi's HR department. You are a nonprofit group independent right. with some community leaders. Yes. Okay. And that difference means what? Well, we're kind of like a liaison per se, if I had this for IBM. And we're not one thing, but we're many things. Um, we are at link with the company. We're um, also in working with the company to say, hey, these policies and procedures can be done different. Um, just like in, dis- in their discipline, there are some overtones of uh, restorative practices in there. Oh, wow. And those are there because of the influence of Green Force? Yes. Actually, we um, conflict resolution, we use restorative circles in the workplace. This almost sounds, um, f- forgive me for even mentioning the word, this almost sounds like some of the work that labor unions do. Yeah, without the unions. Without the union. Right. right. I, I picture right. that. That right. makes sense. So we've had a lot of success with recruitment. To date, we have over 400 applications. Mm. How do people get in touch? You can go to Veridi, uh, com. V-I-R-I-D-I? Yes. Okay. And you can see the link there or you can go go to green force and they all link together green force is easier to spell (laughs) greenforce.org uh the greenforce.org okay uh and is that where the application process starts yes or you can come to 1001 east delavan um follow the signs by napa and you can go to the rear where um entry is and you can um, fill out an application all right The, the last area i wanted to touch on and it's not necessarily related to Green Force, but it is related to your mm. expertise in job development. To what degree do you feel or think that the stadium project out in Orchard Park is transformational? Um, I know that labor unions have traditionally had a tougher time recruiting minorities, but I also know, if we're talking as we did earlier about generational wealth, that some of the welders and the carpenters and the, the, the people that will be needed to build a new stadium out mm-hmm. in Orchard Park are pretty big jobs for someone that might not have a college degree. Uh, is this three-year, four-year project that the stadium's going to be transformational? 
I don't have a lot of hope in thinking it's going to have a, and speaking for the east side of Buffalo, I don't think it will have a big impact for the city of Buffalo itself. Tell me why. Because one of the things in the community benefits agreement is a set aside for minority hiring, uh, is programs that would include outreach within the east side community. So, yes, there are agreements, but how many of those are going to filter out to jobs that impact people? So now you're paying a lot of support to go out and do this work. And once it gets to the person that they're looking for, there's less dollars. When you say support, you mean the kind of stuff like Green Force is doing? What would explain that comment? I'm, I'm not sure I follow you. So it's not the Buffalo Bills that's going out. There's they're they probably partner okay. with agencies or whatever yeah. to contractors. Contractors. So of course they have to get paid, and then it's the trickle down effect. So how much will actually trickle down into the pockets to those that they're trying to target? And then there is, as, as you mentioned earlier, the transportation Transportation, issue. getting out to Orchard Park. I worked at ECC South before. Uh-huh. It was a burden getting to work. It was a 45-minute ride. And if I, there was two different types of traffic. If I had like a 15-minute window. If I left too early, I hit the first set of traffic. If I left too late, I hit the second uh, uh, traffic. So there, there was that little window, and I used to tell people the harder part, hardest part about my job there was getting to work. <laughs> yeah, I can right. believe that. Uh, although I also picture a project like the stadium being a long enough, big enough project that the demand would at least be large, mm-hmm. right? Right. Yes, but what happens after the stadium is built? Those jobs goes away. Yeah. Now, the jobs that are available are, you know, probably not paying a livable wage. Then you're thinking about transportation out there, um, smaller stadium, higher ticket prices. Um, I'm worried that Buffalo would never host the Super Bowl because. Right. Right. Because it's not a dome stadium. And what is the city of Buffalo benefiting off if it's out there? If it was in the city. Maybe there would be, you know, some parking. When I when I lived in um, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, the church I attended benefited off parking from the stadium um, for for Alabama. Sure. They made about six thousand a week uh, on game day. So, and all that money is staying out in Orchard Park. It's not yeah. benefiting and, in the long run. And the transportation issue would certainly be different if the stadium was, yeah, downtown yes. somewhere. Yes, I picture that. Yes. Okay. Um, does a rising tide lift all boats? And by that I mean the stadium, Veridi Parente, um, can more jobs create more jobs? Do you see what I'm asking? Yes, I can see that. Explain. When you start putting more money in people's pockets, they want to spend, they want to improve their life, which creates other jobs. I can see, like, where Veridi is. I can see in three or four years where you're going to start seeing businesses pop up around the plant to support the people in the plant. Again, oh, you mentioned because it's a parts manufacturer. So well, if they're creating a battery for a particular, uh, I don't know, forklift, then the forklift manufacturer theoretically could end up being here too. Yes. Rather than shipping the battery to wherever the forklift yes. already is. And then – small mom and pop shops someone's at some point is going to see 600 people there and say i need to put a restaurant uh, right Tim across Hortons. the street <laughs> someone's going to put a i mean think about all the businesses that used to be across the street when it was american axle yeah, and gm that's true even even if you look at most plants there's a bar somewhere near the plant yeah 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 um the, the, on, on river road uh, <laughs> the, the engine plant has a couple right? right right so those small businesses will pop up and then you would get people who want to buy a house in that neighborhood and walk to work or ride a bike to work or a scooter to work, electric scooter. Yeah, because so, they're there. Right. Okay. And it's the neighborhood they grew up in. And I grew up in that neighborhood. Ah. All right. Harvey, this has been great. Thank yes, you for, uh, for sharing. 
especially uh, the earlier stuff about Selma. Really appreciate that you were able to, to talk a little bit about that. As we close here, real quickly, if someone wants more, it's thegreenforce.org. Thegreenforce.org. Harvey Miles, thanks so much. It's my pleasure. This is WBFO and WBFO HD1 Buffalo, W-O-L-N-O-L-E-N, and WUBJ Jamestown. I'm Dave Debo. Thanks for listening.